The Cuban Missile Crisis. NASA's Apollo missions. The Open Skies Treaty. Operation Olive Harvest. Hurricane Katrina. These events span nearly 70 years and all share an unheralded technical connection. A Cold War era film reconnaissance sensor known as the Optical Bar Camera, OBC, which utilized a community of expertise, including pilots, film processing technicians, and imagery analysts to meet the evolving intelligence needs of the nation. In 2023, as the Department of Defense completed its transition from film to digital photography, the OBC community fulfilled its last tasker, a final mission that was more than 30 years in the making. My first supervisor ever said, welcome to Beale, you're not gonna be here that long because what film is going away? That was 36 years ago. The OBC mission originated as part of the Cold War scramble to obtain hard photo intelligence on Soviet nuclear capabilities. There was this idea that uh, they were getting ahead of the United States and that we needed to, to match what they were doing. And so top leaders realized they needed hard intelligence to figure out what's happening in the Soviet Union. The optical bar camera provided that. Designed for high-flying reconnaissance planes, like the U-2 and SR-71, the OBC featured a slit assembly camera bar and rotating film spindle which allowed it to cover an area 140 degrees across, while maintaining high altitude resolution more than four times that of existing cameras. The analog system required precise handling. The pilots would need to be briefed on how to correctly take the photographs based on where they were going and when. We had to fill a green card out for the pilots so the pilots knew how to control the cameras at what time when they were over what place. So it was important for us to know, are they going to a jungle environment? Are they an urban environment? Or are they a desert environment? It was a question of making sure you had the settings correct. Uh, usually the sensor worked precisely as, as designed and intended. So I think it had a good reputation overall. And uh, it's certainly less complicated than some of the other sensors we were flying at the time. On landing, the film was transported for complex photochemical processing, a critical step originally accomplished through a covert partnership between the CIA and Eastman Kodak facilities in Rochester, New York. The film processing is a very complex, fun game. So you got chemistry, you got electrical, you got mechanical, you got all these rollers, you got all this stuff going on. You get one chance. Once that image is flown, the government has spent millions of dollars to put that airplane up and to load that film. We get the film delivered, and if anything happened to that film, there was no way to replace it. So it was to the level of complexity where every little detail had to be paid close attention to, all the way from the way the chemistry was mixed to the time the, the film actually got put into the processor and came out the other end. Our goal, was to not mess up an inch of that film because that inch of film that could have been messed up in the processor, there could have been vital intelligence on there that we could never recover. In the early decades, Kodak technicians worked closely with photo interpreters from the National Photographic Interpretation Center, NPIC, who provided expert on-site review of OBC film as it was processed. This joint approach allowed imagery to be immediately edited or duplicated to meet mission needs, and allowed NPIC to quickly identify additional targets. In October 1962, this Kodak-NPIC partnership played a pivotal role in averting the grave nuclear threat of the Cuban Missile Crisis. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the OBC was one of the sensors used. Uh, they had near-continuous U-2 flights going over Cuba, monitoring the situation. During those tense 13 days, Kodak and NPIC worked together to covertly move specialized OBC film processors, printers, chemicals, and technicians to the Naval Reconnaissance and Technical Support Station in Suitland, Maryland. They moved all of that to Maryland so that it would be uh, just a stone's throw from the White House and President Kennedy's team. As the crisis unfolded, 
This ability to observe and verify made the difference between war and peace. Over 400 reconnaissance flights have been flown over the island of Cuba by U.S. military aircraft. These reconnaissance flights provided the essential basis for the national decisions taken with respect to Cuba in October. By the mid-1960s, use of the tried and tested OBC expanded beyond reconnaissance planes. In 1966, reconnaissance satellites began incorporating OBC technology with the KH-9 hexagon utilizing the camera as a way to merge previously isolated panoramic and high-resolution capabilities of the earlier Corona and Gambit satellite systems. This camera provided tremendous intelligence to the United States security uh, community. It allowed President Nixon to know what the Russians were doing, so he was able to sign the SALT Treaty, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And then some of you are pretty young, but many of you are not. And you must remember President Reagan, who said, trust, but verify. These are the cameras that verified what Russia and other Cold War enemies and countries did. In the early 1970s, a modified optical bar camera also flew on the final three Apollo moon missions, which focused on scientific experiments and exploration. From July 1971 to December 1972, Apollo OBCs produced an unprecedented 4,731 high-resolution stereo and monoscopic images. These became the basis for products like the lunar mosaics created by the Defense Mapping Agency. Back on Earth, the transition to digital photography was gaining support, but the optical bar camera continued to be the best technology for certain reconnaissance missions. It's good for analysis and the fact that you can get a really small footprint on an image so you can really make out what's down there, which really helps. In 1973, as Mideast tensions devolved into the Yom Kippur War, quick coordination between the Defense Intelligence Agency, Air Force, and Strategic Air Command resulted in Operation Giant Reach, which sent SR-71s equipped with OBCs to monitor locations in Egypt, Israel, and the Golan Heights region of Syria. The OBC was the primary sensor utilized throughout Operation Giant Reach, which eventually transitioned to Operation Olive Harvest in 1974. The, the Olive Harvest Treaty was part of confidence building measures, so it would fly over the Sinai uh, every two weeks. Uh, our analysts uh, would exploit the imagery, uh, which were counting pieces of equipment on both sides of the border, uh, produce reports that were then channeled through the State Department and given to both of those countries as kind of a reassurance that neither country was uh, preparing to invade each other. So uh, really a big part, NGA played a big part of kind of keeping the peace in the Middle East. This mission would continue for nearly 50 years. In the aftermath of Desert Storm, U-2 missions continued to collect imagery over Iraq. And even at 70,000 feet, they were not without their risks. The tactics we were using basically were for us to fly unarmed and unescorted over Baghdad during those times. However, it was important that we were able to collect the information that the UN could then use. And there were times when uh, Saddam actually threatened to shoot us down at one point or another. So uh, the missions that I flew, uh, I was actually never engaged by the, the Iraqis. However, they, there were times when they would shadow us to try to intimidate us. The OBC also was a vital tool leading up to and during the Bosnian War. I actually ended up flying over a place called Srebrenica, and the images that we, we found from those missions uh, actually reflected uh, mass graves. And uh, these are the kind of contributions to, uh, to, the, to the knowledge of our country, to the UN, to other people that reflect what these bad guys were doing, and um, it helped us find the will to intervene. What was interesting on that particular mission that I was flying on, um, one of my oxygen systems failed. The mission rules are to abort when you have one fail. And so I said, well, I've come this far and this is really important and we think something bad is going on down there. But I decided to press on because I thought it was worth the risk. So um, I, I gambled right. And so if I gambled wrong, uh, you'd be talking to somebody else. Another long-term OBC mission emerged in the 1990s 
as the Cold War gave way to regional hotspots that could quickly flare into global security threats. The Open Skies Treaty, which established a regimen of unarmed aerial observation flights between more than 20 nations, was signed in 1992 as a response to this global instability. For more than 30 years, optical bar cameras supported treaty requirements, helping to foster trust and transparency between nations. The post-Cold War era also saw significant changes within the OBC community. In the 1990s, as digital technology became dominant, Kodak phased out its OBC film processing, transferring primary responsibility to the Defense Intelligence Agency. OBC processing was transitioned to the Defense Intelligence Analysis Center, DIAC, which was augmented as needed by sites including Beale Air Force Base. In 2002, organizational control of the film processing mission again transferred, this time to NGA, with the mission continuing to operate out of the DIAC lab for another nine years. Throughout this time, the OBC community maintained an active mission roster. It's been critical, especially in the last 20 years, in the AOR in Afghanistan, and first in OEF, and then OIF in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And we've supplied film forward and digital uh, material imagery forward, which in fact is used in planning many of the operations in the AOR. After processing, the film made its way to analysts at NGA. The film would arrive uh, in St. Louis for exploitation uh, every two weeks. Uh, so like six crates of uh, rolled canister film uh, and the analysts would, uh, would exploit the film on these old Robertson uh, light tables. Alongside diplomatic and defense mission needs, the OBC community also processed and analyzed imagery critical to major relief and recovery efforts at home and around the world. Anytime there was flooding, anytime there was an earthquake, we knew that the U-2 aircraft was going to be there and capture that information in an unclassified environment so that way we could share that imagery with search and rescue parties and other government agencies that were helping with those types of activities. Within 72 hours of Hurricane Katrina making landfall along the Gulf Coast in 2005, for instance, OBC technology was dispatched from Beale Air Force Base as part of a groundbreaking consolidation of national and commercial imagery assets. In just two weeks, OBC flights photographed over 130,000 square miles covering four states. No other available sensor could provide the same level of high resolution coverage in the time available. Being that we're broad area, we can cover a tremendous amount of ground coverage in one flight versus what we consider soda straw imaging with the uh, digital sensors. Similarly, following a major earthquake and tsunami in Japan that triggered a nuclear incident at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant in 2011, OBC technology was utilized to determine the location and extent of damage. In a mission overseen by the 9th Intelligence Squadron, more than 10,000 feet of OBC film was obtained and processed at Beale Air Force Base which supported NGA efforts to leverage all analytic and technical GUN capabilities to provide a framework for Operation Tomodachi, the U.S. government's response to the crisis. NGA and the 9th Intelligence Squadron collaborated again in 2014 in response to a humanitarian crisis unfolding at the peak of Mount Sinjar in Iraq, where the Yazidi, a religious minority, were trapped as a result of ISIS gains in the region. Because the OBC was the only sensor capable of capturing the entire crisis area in the required time frame, it was specifically requested to obtain updated information related to both refugee camp dispositions and enemy order of battle. After completing its mission, over 1,000 frames of OBC imagery were provided to geospatial analysts. Within 12 hours, 47 intelligence products were disseminated downrange in support of airlift operations. In 2021, after nearly 40 years at the DIAC, OBC film processing returned to Rochester, New York, where NGA would continue the mission from a contractor facility. In its final years, the OBC mission narrowed to providing vital imagery, which enabled continued American support of the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty. The last U-2 OBC flight occurred in June 
2022. This flight signaled the end of one of aerial reconnaissance's most historic pieces of equipment. We need to make sure that we stay technologically relevant and we need to be able to be as efficient and effective as possible. So that means we have to retire some things at some time, hopefully at the right time and not any earlier, but then we have to move forward. It's been a workhorse for the intelligence community for decades. The optical bar camera is a sensor that has been called on time and time again. Uh, even when technology looked like it was far outpacing what the optical bar camera initially was designed to do. The film legacy just kept going and going and going because there was no other sensors and even to this day it can capture as much ground you know in a broad area synoptic way as the OBC film camera. Shortly after the flight, the film processing mission at Beale Air Force Base was closed. This closure marked NGA's facility as the last in-house Department of Defense Intelligence Community film processing operation in existence. One year later, the last roll of film was developed at the Rochester facility, marking the end of NGA and the DOD's involvement in wet film processing. I think anytime you end uh, a program, it is bittersweet, and it's very bittersweet because this has uh, a lot of people put heart and soul into wet film processing for a very long time in a very meaningful way. These are great professionals, and they should take great pride in what they've done. Uh, some people obviously were at the OBC program at the beginning and are no longer here, but the legacy that they bring is, is basically one of the unsung things that makes, makes our world what it is today, makes our country stronger, freer, better. Even though the mission of the OBC and wet film development has come to an end, their impact will still be felt for decades to come. The most important legacy is we've captured over 10 million feet of film, over half a century old, that, uh, that is a record of undisturbed earth. Um, I work a lot with archaeologists and climatologists that are dying to get their hands on this imagery. There's always a new crisis growing, and you never know where that crisis is going to be. But there's a good chance that we have some, some film that was collected over these 60-odd years that will allow us to at least take a look at what the conditions were as a snapshot in time, at a point in time, and then build from there to where we are today to more fully understand the issues. I do truly believe that in the end, that is going to be the legacy of this wet film mission.